take the time to find 1 Peter. All right. Once you've found your place in the book of 1 Peter, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Okay, here's our sermon title. Born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Christ to the revelation. To the revelation of Christ. So by the re- resurrection to the revelation. Our letter that we're reading was originally written by the apostle Paul. Written um, Peter rather. First Peter written by Peter. Probably from Rome is what we believe. And we can see in verse number one that he's writing to Christians who are scattered abroad, these are exiles, and he particularly names Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia, and he names particular places where these Christians are that he is writing to. And now 2,000 years later, by extension, through the divine providence of God, Peter is still writing to us. He writes to us in verse number 2, as the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. So he makes particular reference to the death of Jesus Christ and the shed blood of Christ for our sins. And then he says... Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his underlying abundant mercy. What has he done? He hath begotten us again. He's begotten us again. We have caused us to be born again. Unto what? What? A living hope. How? By what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To? To what? To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and one that does not fade away. Where, pastor, is this? Where is this inheritance? How will I receive it? It is reserved in heaven for you who are being kept by the power of God. How? Through faith. To what end? Salvation. Salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein or because of this, we, us, all of us, greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, you, us, we, are in heaviness through manifold temptations or many sufferings or trials. To what end? For what purpose? Verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, Though it be tried with fire, that 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 faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom, referring to Jesus, we have not seen, yet we love him, we love him, you love. In whom, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with Joy unspeakable, full of glory. To what end? Receiving the end or outcome of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of the living God, you alone are the only one that convicts, shows, reveals, causes those that need to be born again to be born again. Those hearts that are heavy, we pray for them right now. Those that need to hear the word of God, we ask that you would give them, O God, words to hear, faith to believe, 
Trust in the gospel. Be with us this next 40 minutes. Guard our hearts and minds from distractions. Chase away anything that will interfere with the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So you may be seated and here's our basic sermon outline. We want to talk about this mercy of God. This idea of being born from above. What is this all about? A living hope. The resurrection. Trials that come into our life. Move to the revelation of Christ. And ultimately we want to end with the verse number 9. The eternal salvation of your souls. Please notice Peter's particular attention to abundant mercy. You have to love that word abundant. Imagine for a moment abundant mercy. Mercy that doesn't end. Mercy that keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. Do you understand that if God was a state trooper and he had abundant mercy, you'd never get a speeding ticket. Because the mercy would keep flowing. Do you this morning appreciate God's mercy? Do you this morning love God's mercy? This morning, are you thankful for God's mercy? Mercy is the compassion, the forbearance that God has for us as sinners. Us as sinners. Now look, if you don't see yourself as a sinner this morning, this is almost meaningless to you. If you don't see yourself this morning as somebody who sins, I mean somebody who violates God's law, but you say, Pastor, I haven't murdered anyone. Okay, that's awesome. But may I ask you, have you coveted? Have you coveted? You haven't murdered anyone. Wonderful, I'm glad you haven't murdered anyone. Have you looked on anyone with eyes that were murderous? Have you glared at somebody with just animosity that you know that if words and looks could kill, you've done it. You haven't coveted. You haven't murdered. How about stealing? You say, Pastor, I don't steal. Do you punch in early and then go have a cigarette break? That's called stealing. Do you take home pens and paper and things from work? See, we, we can always justify our own sin, can't we? Isn't that easy for us? This morning, you could nod your head because you know you, like me, are guilty of doing that. We're all prone to justifying our own sin. I haven't bore false witness against someone in a court case, but have you lied? Have you ever lied? Are you in need this morning of God's abundant mercy? Peter moves us from this abundant mercy that God has to the word begotten. And begotten is a word that we don't use on a daily basis. It is to be born again. It's the exact same Greek in verse 23. So we know that we can say that God has caused us to be born again. So while this morning you may readily admit to the fact that you know that God caused your birth, that God selected your gender, that God selected your ethnicity, that God selected your parents, that God selected your eye color, God selected your height, God selected your intelligence, God chose, chose, chose. I want to draw your attention now, move you from the physical birth. I want to talk to you about a spiritual birth. That this same God who has begotten you or caused you to be physically born through your mother and father is the same God that spiritually awakens us with inside. Spiritually awakens us. Why do I need to be awakened? I'm fine. I have a pulse. I breathe. What what are you talking about, pastor? I feel fine this morning. You're talking to me about a born again experience? What in the world do you mean? You need to understand that when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, death came upon them. And that death has passed to all generations. That's exactly what Paul teaches us. For by one man, one man, sin passed upon all. He said, that's not fair. You would have sinned if you were there. You're no exception. You know yourself. Maybe you're kid yourself today. And maybe I don't know you, but you know yourself. You know that you would have been the one that would have sinned just like Adam. You ladies would have sinned just like Eve. You're no better. Created perfect as Adam was. Created perfect as Eve was. When that tempter came into that 
garden and caused them to begin to question the word of God, you too would have joined them. And so because of this spiritual death, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. What do you mean, born again? Webster's defining this as regenerating or created again or spiritually reborn. Let me show you. Paul says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. A new creature. That's a particular reference to being born again. A new birth. Turn in your Bibles to John 3, please. Again, if you don't have a Bible, take a pew Bible. You'll find that preaching is so much better when you follow along in your own Bible. It causes you to listen more effectively. You don't zone out and begin to think about the Easter meal that you're preparing and all those kind of distractions. For today, the message I have for you is eternal. And it's far more important than anything you'll eat today. John chapter number 3, please. And would you join me and follow along in this amazing conversation that the Lord Jesus Christ has with Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, reading in verse number 1 of chapter number 3. That same man came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Master, teacher, rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Cutting him off and almost interrupting him, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Nicodemus, except you, Nicodemus, and you today in this church, if you are not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Establishing a declarative statement there. Unequivocally, unless you've been born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man or woman be born when he or she is old? How in the world can I enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born? Jesus responds, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Nicodemus, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And suddenly I see the particular reference to the word spirit there, and I realize Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. A spiritual birth where you, a living being, is born again. You've had a second birth. You can quantify it. You can uh, look at it. You can date it. You can analyze it. And you know, I have been born again. Put your hand up if you've been born again. I've been born again. I know when I was born again. I know when God did an amazing work and I was born again. He says, that which is flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. Do you see it there in verse number six? Put in your margin. Physical birth, put in your margin. Spiritual birth. Physical birth, spiritual birth. Verse seven. Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. When Jimmy Carter announced that he was a born again Christian, it was like it was a separate denomination. And suddenly born again became kind of a faddish idea that perhaps was unique to a particular denomination. I want to tell you right now that born again is not a Baptist idea. Born again is a Bible idea. It's a Bible idea. It doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic or a Lutheran or Episcopalian or a Presbyterian or a Methodist. You need to be born again. It doesn't matter what denomination you are. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter how self-righteous you think you are. You must be born again. There's no question about it. It's unequivocal. You will not see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. Born from above. That's what he's teaching us this morning. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. Put your name right there in verse number 7. The wind blows where it wants, and you can hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it came from and where it is going. So is everything. 
everyone that is born of the Spirit. Imagine that this morning, that even right now, as we are preaching, there's a heart in this auditorium that's being quickened by the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is here in our midst. God the Holy Spirit is moving between pews and moving between hearts. And somebody's heart this morning is being quickened to the reality that Jesus Christ was sent from the Father, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a bloody cross, rose again three days later, and is now on the right hand of the Father. And somebody this morning is believing that for the very first time. Like the green mist in that Don Treader movie, the Holy Spirit goes between the pews, working like only the Holy Spirit can do. Quickening hearts, making them alive. Don't allow anything to distract you this morning. Listen closely to the word of God as we keep working our way. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? And Jesus said to him, aren't you a master teacher of Israel? You don't know these things? What Old Testament have you been reading, Nicodemus? And amazingly so, listen to me please. There are going to be people, David, who grew up in church their entire lives. And they're still not born again. Truly, truly, I say unto you in verse number 11, we speak what we know and testify what we've seen, and you receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things, you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven first even the son of man which is in heaven as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so shall the son of man be lifted up now he's making particular reference to the cross right there in your margin in your bible right next to there cross c-r-o-s-s that's the cross now he's calling to our attention the gospel the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because you don't ascend if you're still in the grave verse 15 that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life and verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so the logical question this morning is when were you born again When were you born again? Stop ignoring me and listen. When were you born again? Pastor, how? How can I know if I've been born again? How can I know if God has caused a spiritual birth inside my soul? I wasn't able to raise my hand like everybody else. I was hesitant. I'm not sure like everyone else is. I've been going to church all my life. How can I know for sure? Let me show you from the Bible text. Turn back to 1 Peter. Turn back to 1 Peter and we'll stay there for the rest of the time. 1 Peter. Take your time to find 1 Peter again. I'm pausing so that you can get there. I want everyone to follow in your own Bible. How can I know? How can I know if I've been born again? How can I know if I'm able to inherit the kingdom of God? Notice in particular in verse number 5, the words through faith. Through faith. Through faith. Wait a minute, we're not done. Look at verse number 7. Your faith. Look at verse number 8. Yet believing. But we're not still not done. Look at verse number 9. Your faith. So in verse number 5, through faith. In verse number 7, we have another reference to your faith. In verse number 8, we are presently believing. And then again, in verse number 9, your faith. So people who, Bill, have been born again, have their faith in Christ. Now, their faith is not in a prayer they prayed. Their faith is not in words that they uttered. Their faith is not in a decision card or a tank full of water. Their faith is in Jesus Christ. 
Their faith is not in Christianity. Their faith is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You say, how do I know if my faith is in the person and work of Jesus Christ? Well, Peter takes two other words and he couples it together. And he says that same person, Sean, who has their faith in Christ, has their hope in Christ. That same person who has their hope in Christ and who has their faith in Christ has a love for Christ. So we're going to take this Trinitarian approach. My faith is in Christ. My hope is in Christ. And I love Christ. And these are coupled together, perfectly joining together. You can't have one without the other. There's no one who says, my faith is in Christ, but I don't love Jesus. There's no one who says that I don't have hope in the future through Christ, but I'm born again. They are all together. Romans chapter number 8, Paul particularly calls attention, salvation in the hope. In the hope. Hope is an important component. And that's what Peter leads us to next. Peter tells us that believers have been born again unto a living hope. A living hope. Consider it with me for just a moment. The importance of hope. Every one of us in this auditorium this morning knows of at least one family member. One family member who's depressed. One family member who's miserable. And in an auditorium this big, listen to me this morning, somebody's been touched with a family member who had suicide. No doubt about it. Why does someone commit suicide? Because they lose hope. They lose hope. That's why you commit suicide. Why is somebody depressed? Because they have no hope. Why is someone miserable in life? Because they've lost their way, their hope. Peter says to us this morning, all of us this morning in this auditorium, and by extension, all that are listening on the webcast, you have a living hope. A living hope. Your hope is not a dead hope. Your hope is a living hope. The focus of your hope is life. The focus of your life is life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came to give them life. And what kind of life? More abundantly. So what is it that secures this living hope? What is it that makes this hope possible? Peter says it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes this hope possible. Look at it in your own Bible so that you can walk with me through the text. From God the Father comes a dispensary of abundant mercy that is continually causing human beings to be born again. And they are born again unto a living hope. And this living hope is made possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is the empty tomb that gives us hope that we too will participate in a resurrection. Now I realize that many of you are young in this auditorium. You do not think about death, but there is a point, I don't know exactly when it happened, but every older person in this auditorium, you begin to think about it more and more and more. It just happens. There's a threshold that you cross. And somehow you begin to think about it just a little bit more than you did the year before. And you realize suddenly that I have less years to live than I've already lived. And that, quite frankly, without a resurrection hope, could become quite depressing. It could become quite depressing. But wait a minute, we're not done. Peter says, I'm not finished. Look at verse number four. This is not just eternal life. It's not just keep on living. Peter says, there's more to this glorious mercy that abundantly sheds upon us a birth again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are going to receive an inheritance an inheritance. Look at this amazing word, an inheritance. And then he says, let me tell you about this inheritance. It is incorruptible. It is undefiled. And it will not fade away. What a glorious description. 
Anybody who's had money in a 401k or mutual fund or bought some stocks before and you've seen it literally evaporate, just evaporate. And if you had some money in one of those banks in Cyprus and they just came and took it out, just removed it, and there was nothing you could do to keep it from happening. They just digitally take it. Peter says, that's not our inheritance. Peter, where'd you get such a wild idea? From the Lord. Matthew 19, 29. Everyone, everyone that has forsaken houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, or lands for my name's sake. What are you talking about? Preacher, can you break it down for us? I mean, what, what, what is this all about? Are you listening? What will they receive? Look at the words. A hundredfold. A hundredfold. Think about this now. Think about the promise that the Lord's making. He... The sovereign God of the universe is keeping track of every single time you sacrifice for the cause of Christ. Every time you give up finances, every time you give up time, every time you give up energy or resources, every time you choose the Lord over a family member who doesn't want you to serve, every time you choose God rather than houses, God rather than brothers, God rather than sisters or father or mother or land or anything else, every single time you say God first, he says, I got that, I got that, I got a record of that. I got a record of that. Now imagine that. This is the sovereign God of the universe keeping track of every single soul's sacrifice for the kingdom of God. What kind of return can I count on? I mean, 10% seems like it would just be incredible. If I could get a 10% return today, I'd be thrilled. And the Lord says, not 10, not 20, not 50, not a 75%. 100 fold 100 fold 100 fold and what else will I inherit everlasting life everlasting life so let's get this straight what are you saying this morning I'm saying that the God who has begotten us unto a living hope is also granted to us an inheritance and yet it's so difficult for us to sacrifice isn't it don't we struggle with that? Well, this is not working here. Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto him on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. From the foundation of the world, for I was a hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Don't you see what the text is teaching us this morning? God is keeping track of every single time you extend grace and mercy and love to somebody else. And what is he promising you? Reward and inheritance. What kind of an inheritance? An inheritance that is incorruptible, an inheritance that is undefiled, an inheritance that will not fade away. Where is this inheritance being kept for me, pastor? In heaven. And so Jesus told them, he said, sell what you have, give alms, provide for yourself bags which grow not old, a treasure in heavens that will not fail, where neither moth nor rust nor anything else can corrupt it. Think about this now. On this Easter Sunday, let me just bring you to the reality. You're working really, really hard to save money to create something that you're going to give to your children. And nine out of ten times, your children is going to blow through it. They didn't work for it. They didn't work for it. They don't appreciate the sacrifice you made. And they're just going to run through it. But how can I keep that from happening? Right there. Right there. Provide for yourself where? Treasures where? In heaven. 
What are you calling us to do this morning? I'm calling you to get focused on what matters. Focused on eternal things. All right, verse number five. We can't stay there too long. Look at verse number five. After telling us about this amazing inheritance that is reserved for us in heaven, Peter moves us to the reality that we are being kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What is this talking about? Let me show you this in the ESV, a slightly different rendering. These are guards that work for the President of the United States. These are highly trained, completely armed warriors. And their job is to protect the President of the United States. And if you had one of these guys on your left side and one of these guys on your right side, you'd go to the mall and wouldn't feel too bad about going to the mall. You could go to the mall on Saturday night at 9 o'clock at night and you think, you know what, let's just walk right out here. I'll go anywhere I want in the mall with guys like this, wouldn't you? Yes or no? Sure you would. You take a walk downtown Atlanta. Let's go up to Chicago and hang out for a while. Why? Look at my left side. Look at my right side. Mess with me? Well, that's cute. No, I didn't put it up there just for cuteness. That's not why I put it up there. It wasn't for a joke to entertain you. I'm trying to give you an illustration. And the illustration is your soul is being kept by a power much greater than two secret service agents. See, I know my own heart. It wavers. I know my own faith. It's weak some days. I'm so glad that I don't have to keep myself saved. I'm so glad that I'm being kept by the power of God. Because you know what I am? I'm a sinner. I'm so glad that God's not there going, your sins are a little bit high today, Sean. This could be the day that you cross the line and lose it. I'm so glad that my soul is being kept by the power of God. What God? The omnipotent God. What God? The sovereign God. What God? The God that creates all things and spoke them into existence is the same God that's saying, I'll watch for your soul. I'll keep it secure. You don't have to worry about losing your salvation. You have to worry about whether you're born again or not. That's the issue. The issue is not, can I lose it? The issue is, do you have it? Do you have it? That's the issue. Do you have it? We think that it's something that we acquire to ourselves and that we hold on to. Do you understand how unbiblical that is? It is God that causes you to be born again. And it is God that secures you. And it is God that keeps you. So, how should I respond to this level of protection? How should I respond to this great security that God has for my very soul? Peter says, rejoice about this. Rejoice greatly about this. Get over the top about this. Praise God for his great sovereign power that watches over my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for securing my eternal life. Thank you for preparing me a place in heaven. Praise the Lord. All right. Who's he writing to? Christians who are being persecuted. And so this is what he says. You are in heaviness through various trials, temptations, sufferings. You say to me, Pastor, if you knew my life, I wouldn't be rejoicing right now. I understand. I understand. I'm not here to criticize you. Some of you are going through some incredible trials right now. You've e emailed me some of these trials. Others haven't shared them yet. It's difficult. You're suffering. You're in great pain. You've lost a loved one. You've had a son or daughter commit suicide. It's been a tough year for you. I got it. We're not going to rejoice 24 hours a day. 
We will have seasons of struggle. We will have days of difficulty. Our life will not be on cloud nine 24 hours a day. There will be tough times. You will lose a baby. It's difficult. But why? Why, Pastor? Why, why do I have to go through this? Verse 7 explains it. That, the trial, or the testing of your faith. That's what you're going through. This is a trial. This is a test. But wait a minute, Pastor. I graduated. I don't want to take any more tests. Life is a test. It's a big trial. Suffering will happen. Difficulties will come into your life. But I want to ask you on this side, how will you come out on the other side? How will you endure on the other side? Peter says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. Trials are designed to test the genuineness of your faith. The person who's been truly born again goes through the trial and comes out on the other side. They remain steadfast. They remain unmovable. They are embedded in their faith in Jesus Christ and nothing can take away their living hope. They believe that God is working all things to a predetermined end in their life and that this very trial is ordained by God for them. Are you going through a trial? Are you going through a trial? In the back, is there anyone going through a trial? How does that help you have a different perspective on trials? Well, Pastor, how can I know if I'm been born again? Number one, faith, hope, and trust, and love in Christ. Number two, Christians come out on the other side after trials. They go through them. And they realize this trying is perfecting my faith. It's testing the authenticity of my faith. And because I have remained steadfast by God's grace in this trial, I have a greater assurance that I am born again. Thomas Schreiner said it like this. Why is it God's plan for Christians to suffer? Verse 8 provides the reason. Sufferings function as the crucible for faith. Trials test the genuineness of faith. Revealing whether your faith is true or authentic or not. If faith proves to be real, the believer will receive praise, glory, and honor. When? When Christ returns. What words will that sound like? It might sound something like, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I saw you come through that trial. You remain faithful. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Those are all words that communicate what? Praise, adoration, honor. Well done. Faithful servant. Those are all words to encourage us. What are we looking for? I want to hear those words. Let me remind you this morning, church, that this church is going to burn up. Let me remind you this morning that that boat that you love is not making it into heaven. Let me remind you for a moment that that IRA that you pay attention to, that IRA, it's not going to heaven. The closet full of clothes, not going to heaven. The new kitchen with the granite countertops, not going to heaven. What makes it then? Your soul. Your soul, your soul, even the body that you're so proud of, even the body that you work on and it's chiseled like this and your stomach is like this and you can see all the rows, that is not going to heaven. One thing makes it across and it's your soul. That's all, your soul. So Peter moves to the focus of our trials and it's looking for the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word appearing right here is the same word in Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the book of Revelation all about? The second coming of Jesus Christ. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So now Peter juxtapositions the reality that we are looking for Christ, yet we have not seen him. We're looking for Christ, but we haven't seen him. He says it like this. Whom having not seen, you love. So that's what I want to ask you this morning. 
I want to ask you this simple question, and I'm going to ask everyone here. When was the last time you told Jesus you love him? Outside of church. When? When was the last time you expressed love to Christ? When was the last time that your heart was guided by your affection for Christ? The affections of your heart are a test of whether you're born again or not. Do you love Jesus? I don't care if you've asked Jesus in your heart 4,000 times and meant it every time. I want to know, do you love Jesus? You say, Pastor, why are you in our face? Can't you just stay up there? I'm here for one reason. I care. I care. Do you not recognize that you have a soul and that soul will live in heaven or that soul will live in hell? But you'll live somewhere for all eternity. And you're sleeping right now. It's amazing. I'm actually looking out into the auditorium and there are people sleeping and we're talking about the difference between heaven and hell. We're talking about the difference of spending eternity in the torments of flames and glorious eternal life with Jesus Christ. What do the affections of your soul reveal about your faith in Christ? Do you love basketball more than Jesus? Do you love basketball more than Jesus? Yet believing. Running out of time. He moves in verse number 8 to this present tense of I believe. And I rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Why? Why should I rejoice, Pastor? I'm Dying of cancer. You're right. You're right. But you know what? There isn't anyone that doesn't die. Everyone dies. You're dying of cancer. You're dying of dying. I mean, everybody dies, Dick. It doesn't matter what. Everyone. I'm not talking about your physical body this morning. I want to know about your soul. Your soul's not going to die. Your soul will live in hell or your soul will live in heaven. But your soul is going to be somewhere. And that's what he ends with, verse number 9. These people receive the outcome of their faith. The what? The salvation, wait a minute, of your souls. Your souls. So here we are. These are the closing questions. Have you been born from above? Are you born again? Or, or will you just wait another year and try a little bit longer? Have you been born above? Born again. Do you know that your soul has been quickened by God? Do you have a living hope? Do you have a living hope? Are your trials proving your faith? I know we're going through trials. Is it proving your faith? Or is it showing that it's not authentic? Question number four. Is the fact that you are being kept by God's sovereign power an encouragement to you? Are you thankful that you're being kept by God's sovereign power? And question number five, do you love the one you've yet to see? Do you love the one you've yet to see? It's not hard to love the things that you see. It takes faith to love the one you haven't seen. Let's pray.
Let me ask this question right off the bat. Share with me right now if you're going through a trial and you'd like me to pray with you. Slip your hand up right now if you're going through a trial and you'd like me to pray for you. Yes, sister. Yep. Couple here, one here. Yes, young man. In the back. Anyone going through a trial right now? Yep. Going through a trial? Yes, I see you. Going through a trial. I mean, this is a trying of your faith. All right. Yes, sister, I see your hand. You're going through a trial, aren't you? It's tough. It's not easy. Yes, sir, I see your hand. You're going through a trial. Another one over there. This is difficult right now. You're going through a trial. You're in a period of testing, yes? Going through a struggle right now. Yes, right here. Another one right back here. It deals with a family member. It deals with finances. It deals with your children. You're going through a struggle right now. You're definitely going through a solid struggle. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for you right now. Join me. Father in heaven, there are numerous hands that went up. And these people realize that they are in the midst of a trial. They're going through suffering. They are struggling and they are being tested. And it is painful. And there is suffering. And there is tribulation. And it's not fun. And it's miserable. And they need your grace. They need you infuse you, you, we need you, God, to infuse them with grace. Give them faith to trust that this trial has been ordained by you and that there's a light, there's a hope, there is a revelation, there is something to anticipate, something to look forward to, that there's an other side and that when they come out of the trial, they'll know that their faith has been strengthened James tells us to count it all joy, to count it all joy. How in the world, pastor, can I count it all joy when I come into these trials? Because these trials work within you a steadfastness in God. So I pray, Lord, that for every hand that was raised, that you would immediately infuse upon these faith, grace, and give them hope. Give them, oh God, a living hope. How many would say this morning, I'm being very personal right now. Maybe you've never had a preacher ask such interpersonal questions. How many would say, Pastor, I need to believe to be born again. I want to believe. I want to be born again. I, I believe that God sent his son, and today needs to be my day of being born again. Is there anyone here that God has sent into our assembly? And you would say, that's me, preacher. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Is there anyone that would slip your hand up and say, that's me. I need to be born again. Anyone else? I need, yes, sir, right here. Anyone else? I need to be born again. All the way in the back. I've got that hand. There's two more in the back. I need to be born again. I don't know whether I have assurance of my salvation and I need to be born again. Let me encourage you this very moment. If you know you need to be born again, I'm going to ask you, encourage you, plead with you to put your faith in Christ. Christ came, was crucified, was buried, and rose again to be your Savior. I'm going to ask you to believe on Christ right now. Trust in Christ. Rely upon Christ. Love Christ. You say, Pastor, are there particular words I need to say? No. 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 This, this comes from the heart. This faith is a gift from God. And you believe you believe. What must I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on Him as your Savior. Believe on Him as your Lord. Believe on Him as the God of the universe. Let's stand together for a moment.